Welcome. Could everybody find a seat? Um, pull, pull some people away from the bar, which is always painful, I know. So that's me. Um, we're going to get underway. I'm Merrill Brown, Director of the School of Communication and Media here at Montclair State University. Welcome to the first formal session of our two-day conference. Great to have you here. Uh, great to be able to show you Montclair State. Great to show you our School of Communication and Media, which is thriving. Um, and great to expose you to the great work that the Center has done over four years, the Center uh, for Cooperative Media, now run by Stephanie Murray, who I'll introduce in a minute. But just a little bit of background, the Center was uh, founded, as I said, four years ago and is funded today by a series of foundations by Montclair State University, the Knight Foundation, the Dodge Foundation, and the Dem uh, Democracy Fund. Uh, it's also supported by the faculty and staff of our school. School of Communication and Media includes three uh, large programs, uh, filmmaking, television, digital, uh, digital media, and television, radio, and journalism. And the third one is communication studies. We have 800 students who, take, um, who are majors in our schools and a couple thousand students taking courses in our programs. If you look over there, just a short ways, it's slightly lit. You'll see a new 105,000 square foot building that we're building to house the school. Included in that building are four studios, three television, one film, a theater, which is where this conference is likely to convene next year, a multi-platform newsroom, which we hope center partners will be uh, participants in as we build it and, um, and build a cooperative movement within it. We hope it's going to be an asset uh, for all of you that are center members and for the larger New Jersey ecosystem. So there's a lot going on here. We're very proud of it. The school, like the center, is only four years old. So we're in a developmental phase as well, just as the center is. Uh, we'll be telling you more about the center over the course of the conference. But our main goal is to engage all of you and the additional 75 or so people who will join us tomorrow, uh, not just, uh, in our work, but in each other's work. This is about a sharing conference where lots of new ideas hopefully will be developed and explored. This year's conference is about sustainability. This is our third conference, year one, also held uh, in this very uh, facility, was about, um, was about innovation. It was called, uh, you know, Innovate Local. Last year's was about engagement, called engagement, uh, Engage Local, and this year's is Sustain Local, about sustainability. And we think those are really great pillars that all of us can use as we think about the evolution of local media and how we think about the development of the New Jersey ecosystem, which obviously is a key part of what we do every day here. So thank you all for coming. I look forward to meeting with many of you. Um, we expect to have a great session. Uh, presentations are just as exciting and to kick things off. I'm pleased to introduce you to the new director of the center. She's been here since the spring. She's got an extraordinary background, and she's done a great job pulling together both this conference, building a team at the center, and integrating fully into the work of the university and, and our school. Uh, she is uh, Stephanie Murray. Uh, this is the building I was just describing. By the way, she is Stephanie Murray, and I'm pleased to welcome her to the stage. Stephanie? Thank you. Thanks, Meryl. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. It's, this is a great intimate setting and I'm really thankful that you made the trek here to Montclair State University to University Hall and you're with us tonight and to kick off a wonderful conference we have a great lineup of speakers starting this evening and heading into tomorrow um, and before we get started with our presentations tonight I um, want to take a quick moment to recognize our sponsors we have um, an excellent lineup of sponsors who really made this conference possible and without their support um, it would not have been uh, nearly great event that it is, so I'm really thankful to them. That includes the Joe R. Dowd Foundation, the Democracy Fund, the Knight Foundation, the American Press Institute, Broad Street, iCopyright, Busyhood, the New Jersey Chapter of the I Professional Journalists, and Lion Publishers. So thank you very much to all of our sponsors. And of course, I want to give another special additional shout out to the American Press Institute. Thank you. And now to officially get Sustain Local underway, I want to introduce our first presenter, and that's Liz Worthington. So I have the pleasure of introducing Liz Worthington, who is the Content Strategy Program Manager for the American Press Institute, where she manages APS program to help publishers create data-driven data content strategies. Liz joined API 
after working as a senior editorial trainer, manager, and editor for Patch.com. Before that, Liz worked as a reporter for the Island Packet in Hilton Head, South Carolina, and the Culpeper Star Exponent in Culpeper, Virginia. Liz is a graduate of the University of Missouri at Columbia. Please welcome Liz Worthington to the stage. Um, we have a program that is intended to help publishers figure out how to better engage their audience. And we, the way that people consume their news is so different now. If you think about how it evolved, we started with the appointment viewing. You got your newspaper in the morning, or you tuned into a broadcast at a certain time. And then came the era of the 24-hour cable news uh, stations and you could watch news at any time and then came the disruption of social media and now we're in this phase where people can get their news at any time from any source through any network we call it the personal news cycle and the key part of it is that your audience is really in charge if you think about some of these brands you see here they are particularly good at doing something and we, what we've learned in the research we've done at API is that the web really rewards specialization. Sorry, I don't know why my slides keep doing this. <laughs> but um, online, there's always going to be a better source, potentially a click away, whether it's someone creates a better site than you, a better app than you, a better service. The research that we've done, we know now that most Americans of all ages are cross-platform, multi-source news consumers. The other thing we know is that the biggest determinant of where people go for their news is not their age and it's not their politics. It's topic. It's the kind of information that they're looking for. If you think of the old model for newspapers, it operated more like a general store where we offered a little bit of everything to everyone. And that made us particularly convenient, but not excellent at any one thing. What we try to help our partners understand is you need to become indispensable to your audience on a few key topics, things that you really want to excel at and be the leader in coverage on. You also need to be able to transform your data into something better. We inherited metrics that were never created for journalists. Uh, how many of you use Google <laughs> Analytics every day? Okay, they're great at telling you if a particular story does well. They're not good at telling you why. They're good at telling if your overall traffic is increasing. But what are the qualities of your journalism that really drive the engagement with your audience? If you're like some of our friends at API and like us, you're probably asking yourself this, these questions. Like which metric is it that matters the most? Or what drives readership in different beats? Or how do qualities like story type and voice and initiative really affect the engagement with your audience? We were getting these questions three years ago from publishers who wanted to make better decisions. They wanted to make more empirical choices about what they cover and how they cover it. And at first we thought, well, let's take a look at your Google Analytics and see what kind of trends we can draw from that. And we qu quickly learned that there's only so much that you can learn from that. And we thought there was a need for something better, which led us to create Metrics for News. We are a nonprofit. If you don't know much about API, we operate more like a think tank. We focus on a lot of research. We have several different programs. This is one of them. Um, but this happened by accident, sort of out of necessity from publishers asking us, can you help us answer these questions that we're trying to figure out? This is not the only way to track audience engagement, but it is one solution that we think has worked really well. And it goes beyond what you can already learn from those conventional analytics you might use every day. One piece of this that makes it different from other metrics programs is you can figure out how and why readers engage with your content. And you can learn that by tagging your content for just a few key variables that you care about. 
you would customize this. We would work with you and, and ask you, what is it you're trying to learn about your content? What kind of questions or specific curiosities do you have? And we track things a little bit differently. We also have the ability to combine the data that we would collect from your tagging with your existing analytics so that you can answer questions like, how does my watchdog work perform? Or what works inside my government coverage or my education coverage? We think it's really important to compare like things to like things. You can't compare your city government coverage to a celebrity story that went viral. It's just not fair to compare those. You have to be able to look at a particular content area and see what is it that works or what is it that doesn't work inside that content area. Or more likely, how can I cover this beat differently and you can learn that by just focusing on some of the key journalistic qualities that drive engagement. So how do we measure engagement? Um, and we work with lots of newsrooms around the country and we find this problem a lot, that editors often feel overrun by data, much of it pulling them in uncomfortable directions. We think there's a way to solve for that by blending your data into a single index and it can be weighted to what you care about. We call this the overall engagement index, and it is a blended metric that consists of page views, time spent, and social sharing characteristics. That allows you to transform your data into something powerful, and it can also allow you to make your analytics both comprehensive and simple. We also can twin your data with um, audience research. We do this with a lot of partners who maybe haven't done any market research before. And it's pretty different from conventional market research. We're not going to ask your audience questions that can later be used to describe them to advertisers. We're going to ask them questions about their lives. Why do they live in their communities? What do they like about it? What are they particularly passionate about in their life? Or what are they worried about? And we're going to see how does that match up with your coverage? How does that match up with what you produce, but also with what people are engaging with? Our partners are using this data to identify and build franchise topics. Some of them call them pillars or tent poles, but these are topics at which you want to excel at this coverage. You want your community to see you as the leader in coverage, as their go-to source for this kind of information, something that they can't live without. We work with about 60 partners across the country we work with very small community papers. We work with some major metros. We work with some TV and radio stations and a few niche-oriented publications. And we've analyzed over half a million pieces of content now that have come through this program. I want to share just a few key findings of what we've learned um, that might be useful for you in your everyday reporting. The first thing we've learned is that initiative really matters. When we talk about initiative, we're talking about stories that you dream up. You're not reacting to news or newsmakers. You are generating a unique angle on a story idea or pursuing an enterprise type of piece. There aren't enough of these. Across all of our partners, it makes up just 6% of all content. Initiative is different from enterprise. When we talk about initiative, we're talking about stories that are your own idea. It could certainly be an enterprise story. It could also be something you just took a unique angle on a daily story and turned it around pretty quickly. When we talk about enterprise, we define it as the level of effort that went into something on a scale from something pretty simple, like maybe a brief or a blog post, to something you might do every day, like a daily news story, to something more involved, like a major enterprise package or series or investigation. Major enterprise tends to boost engagement by about 40% uh, on average across all our partners. That's over 50% more views and over 70% more shares. But there's even fewer of these than we saw with the initiative coverage. It makes up just 1% of all content. We also found that audio and visual elements are pretty key. That's probably not surprising to you. Uh, we found that if you add one photo to a story, it can boost engagement by about 20%. If you add multiple photos, it can boost engagement by over 50%. Adding audio and video allows you to boost the engagement by over 70%, plus it creates the new advertising opportunities that are cross-platform. 
Another finding that surprises people is people like long stories, even online, even on their mobile phones. The conventional wisdom that writing for the web has to be short and fast and writing for mobile even more abbreviated simply is not true. We found that long form journalism averaging over 1,200 words tends to drive up the engagement by about 60%. Now that doesn't mean that you just write everything long, but it can help you figure out where is it worth us devoting time to long form journalism or major enterprise. We also found that writing it straight still works. Um, that drives a lot of engagement for most hard news, especially crime and government. But there are some topics where analysis works better. And we found that is particularly true with topics that are cultural, like food, dining, and sports. Of course, the analysis is going to differ by market and by publication we work with. And the reason that readers engage with your content will vary by topic. We have a particular element of the program that allows you to hone in on why do readers engage with my content? For things like, does it help them solve a problem? Is it explaining something complex behind the news? And I just want to share a couple examples of certain content types, what we found. With government coverage particularly, we found that the watchdog coverage drives up engagement by over 30%. Anything you're writing that's holding people or institutions in power accountable. Initiative makes a big difference here, as does major enterprise. And one interesting finding is that across all 60 markets we work with, about 75% of all government stories do not include photos. But when you include a photo, you can drive up the engagement by doubling the views and the shares. That could be one simple thing you can try if you're trying to boost the engagement to your government coverage. In sports, for example, we found a different story. We found that analysis is one of the biggest drivers of engagement here by over 50%. And initiative makes a huge difference here, more than any other topic. It drove up the engagement by over 90% across all 60 markets that we worked with. So what does this look like at a newsroom? How have they used this data? What have been some of the results? It's a question I often get. And you might be asking, too, what is a program like this? The first ROI is what you learn, not what you earn. When you look at your content and can figure out what are engagement for us that we can turn into franchises, it can be very powerful. We have one partner in Pennsylvania that wanted to transform the crime coverage. They knew coming into the program this was going to be an engagement driver for them. What they didn't know that they learned through the audience survey was how big of a concern it really was in the community. They had had a very violent year. There had been a lot of teenage deaths, a lot of problems with drugs and break-ins and burglaries. And in the survey, it was overwhelming how people were so concerned about this. They wrote things in the survey like, I'm afraid I might get shot. I don't feel like my kid is safe at school. I'm afraid someone's going to break into my house because it happened to my neighbor three months ago. And when they looked at their data, they saw that crime was definitely one of their biggest engagement drivers. But the way they were covering it was mostly through daily stories, crime briefs. They didn't include very many photos. And the program guided them to write with more enterprise, write with more initiative, include more photos in your coverage. Also, approach crime from an explanatory angle. People really want to understand why are these crimes happening in my community? What's being done to keep us safe? They decided to make those changes. As a newsroom, they also talked about how do we want to approach this coverage? They decided to cover every major crime from the moment it happened through the court system. And they also decided to take a more humanistic view to their crime coverage. These were angles not just on the suspects and the victims, but also on the families and on the community and how it impacted the community. And over the course of a year, they saw 200% growth in their page views to their crime coverage and 250% growth to their shares. We have another partner in Florida that focused on three franchise topics, the environment, business, and a lifestyle type franchise. And they definitely saw growth to the franchise content, but they also saw the added benefit of having their metrics lift to all of their content. Across everything they published, they saw 40% growth in page views over the course of a year, 77% more time people were spending with their content, and over 100% more shares. We also work with a few companies that have multiple properties. 
Um, one company in particular is a cluster of very small community papers. And by everyone taking this approach, this franchise approach, they rolled them out differently, um, usually over time, focus on one, get that down, focus on the next. And they saw 25% growth in engagement across the company by taking this approach. And they saw even more views and shares. So there are different kinds of ROI. The first one I mentioned is what you learn. The other kinds are, this can lead to deeper engagement. You're focusing in on what are my readers engaging with or my users or viewers? How are they engaging with it? How can I change my coverage to adapt to that? And that can lead to more loyalty, less churn and more traffic. It can also correlate to subscriptions. We have the ability now for you to track what subscribers engage with and how is that different from your overall market. And you can build a profile of what a subscriber looks like, what kinds of content they engage with and how they engage with it. And it can also lead to new advertising revenue. So we've been doing this for three years. People are at different stages in the program. We have a couple of examples of where our partners have generated new revenue. One is a few of the, our partner papers were focused on the outdoors. They live in the Pacific Northwest. This is an area people love to enjoy the outdoors. And they weren't really covering it. They were covering it sort of randomly or maybe with a feature on a weekend. But they saw from the survey, people in our community really are passionate about this and we need to do something about it. So they completely shifted their strategy. They hired an outdoors editor. They ended up creating a, a seasonal magazine that focused on different kinds of outdoor activities based on the season. It brought in a completely new revenue stream for them that they weren't getting before. The community also really recognized, hey, they're making a commitment to this now, and I want to be a part of this. They were engaging with the content more. Outdoor enthusiasts wanted to become bloggers and share their expertise, and outdoor retailers wanted to then advertise, and they weren't before. We have another partner that uh, focused on business. They were covering it largely in the form of columns or profiles on local businesses in the community. That's not how people wanted to engage with that content. People were engaging most with their business content when they were helping them solve a problem. So they changed their strategy. They focused more on personal finance type issues. They created a franchise called Money Matters and they also ended up publishing a dashboard of local economic indicators that was great for story idea generation, but also um, ended up getting sponsored by local businesses in the community, bringing in some new revenue for them. And the last example I wanna share is a small paper in Indiana. They found out that people are really interested in the history and sense of place in the community. It was a topic they didn't really expect to get a lot of engagement, but it was. They ended up creating an event around that, partnering with some local businesses and I think the historical society and offering tickets to anyone who wanted to come get a tour of some of the secretive places you might not know in your local town, cool things that they could create an entire tour around and they ended up selling those tickets and creating a, a different kind of revenue stream that they weren't getting before. That's all I have for you. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions. It's a web-based product, yeah. Sorry, the question was, are the products online? Um, so this Metrics for News platform exists outside of your CMS. Um, every partner that we work with would have their own unique URL and their own login. Is there a particular kind of CMS that you need to partner No, the reason we made it exist outside of any CMS is so that it could be compatible with any newsroom or any platform. We have a booth if you guys want, want to talk to us later. Uh, I also want to mention that Liz and API have very generously made um, a mini version, I believe, of your slides available. And you can find them through our center website after the conference. If you want to look at that data again or anything like that. Thanks, Liz. Thank you, Liz. Awesome. So the... Continue on with our presentation tonight. 
I would like to welcome our keynote presenter to the stage. And that is Mr. Gordon Burrell, who is CEO of Burrell Associates. Let me get to my correct page. So Gordon knows a lot about journalism sustainability. He thinks about and researches our business every day as part of his job and his company. Gordon is a local media industry analyst and as I mentioned, CEO of Burrell Associates. Before Gordon started the company, he was vice president of new media for Landmark Communications, where he worked for 22 years. And prior to that, Gordon started his career as a reporter and editor for the Virginian Pilot. In 1989, he began pioneering interactive ventures and helped establish some early TV, newspaper, cable, and network television websites. He helped create Infinite, an internet access and hosting company that was later split up and sold to Earthlink and Gannett Company. He is currently chairman of the Local Media Association and past president of the Newspaper Association of America's New Media Federation. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Glenn Burrell to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm your entertainment for tonight, and I have a tail. I feel like a kangaroo. <laughs> I have a tail. I'm going to be in the front row, so if I spit on any of you people, just punch me in the face. I'll get the message. Um, it really is. It's kind of a cliche to say this, but um, an, uh, it's an honor to, to be here. It really is. This is just such an important conference, and why you are here is such it, it just it's great to see this discussion happening. It needs to happen in the community. It is such an important, we had a great discussion this afternoon, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more tomorrow, but I'm really afraid for journalism. I'm afraid that the business model that we followed for centuries and a media business doesn't quite work in digital media. Everything has migrated to digital. Science fiction is a great predictor of the future. I don't see anybody in Star Trek reading a newspaper or watching TV or listening to radio for that matter. It's going to happen. I don't know if it's 10 years or 20 years or 30 years out, but we're seeing it happen very slowly and steadily. It seems fast to us. The business model we're accustomed to of putting information out there in front of people and interrupting it with advertising does not work in digital media. The screens are too small. People are leaning forward. They don't physically see the ads. There's a myriad of reasons. And what my business does is study. You're going to hear from me a very different story, I think. We study the audience probably the most important to journalism and to media. It's the audience that supports your media. It supports your newsrooms. It's the audience that pays the salaries. It's the advertisers. If your product didn't sell stuff for advertisers, help them get the word out about their businesses, you wouldn't be in business. So I started out as a reporter. I'm really now kind of on the advertising side, I'm following the money, because if I don't, and I don't provide insights and research, and my company does it to for hundreds of media companies, they buy our data and they're looking at the flow of advertising through the marketplace. If we don't do that, there won't be any journalism. So I've moved over to the dark side, but before I was corrupt, I was, and the reason I moved over to the, and people can laugh at any time, by the way, because my jokes... <laughs> Don't get any funnier than this. The, the reason I moved over to that business or advertising side is because I saw some advertising guy's paycheck one time. I thought, shh, I want to be there. Um, but I started out as a reporter years ago. I was an intern for the Virginian pilot. And I was told I was going to be filling in on the obit desk and I was going to be writing the little club news and the Boy Scout jamboree stories. And I didn't want to have any of that. So I made myself scarce, and the fourth day I was at that paper, I had a front page story. It's Sunday's paper, a Metro newspaper. Up on the front page. And I thought that was just, that was just great. By the time I graduated, they offered me a job as a bureau reporter, so I had made it. I was 22 years old, and I was going to be a bureau chief. That was my title. I found out I was the bureau chief of a five-county area where the largest city had 5,000 people. And I was the bureau chief of one, and it was me. And I didn't like that at all. I called my editor. His name was Cletus Peacock. That was his name. He looked like a fat Richard Nixon. 
And I said, Cleet, what did I do? And he said, you hot shot whippersnapper, you're going to have to find how, find out how to tell the story of a local community. The stories aren't going to come to you. You're going to have to go find them. And I said, what do I write about? And he said, there's a front page story in everybody. Just figure out what it is. Click. <laughs> he told me I would be there for no more than two years, and if I were more than two years, it would be my own fault. I was there two years to the day, and I started working on them after a year and a half. But I learned how to tell the story, and that's what I want to tell you about. That is your role. Your role as media folks is to tell the story. Tell the story of what's happening in the community. That doesn't sound new to you, but what I'm talking about is telling a story in a different way or with a different set of people backbone of this country, the 21 out of 22 million businesses that are local, that support your media products, their story needs to be told. And you have the skills as media people to do it. I think you have the responsibility to do it. So that's the story I want to tell you, and I want to lay that out and show you that I think that journalism needs to be sustained. I think we desperately need to find a model to support what journalism has been doing, in fact, in some cases failing to inform the public, breaking beyond all this great cacophony of social media and just crazy stories that just get pushed out here and there. I think we need to find a way to sustain journalism, and I think this is it, what I'm about to tell you. So my roots in the newspaper industry go beyond just being a reporter. That's me on the right, by the way. I was a cute little dog. I delivered newspapers in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Bulletin. That was the guy who delivered the truck. We'd make him a birthday cake. Um, and so I go back even farther than that. My great-great-grandfather worked at the Germantown Telegraph. And he was a printer. And so there might be some printer's ink in my blood. But around that time, and this is really interesting, the story that you can really see happening. There he is. That's my great-great-grandfather. It's around that time blacksmiths were facing the same thing that the news industry faces today. They were standing out in front of their blacksmith shops with anvil and, uh, and, and hammer in hand, and they were watching their customer base go by. The American blacksmith, this is from 1910, was writing a bunch of stories, just kind of like you see an editor and publisher today, about you know, horseshoes, and they had ads for anvils and aprons. And the biggest problem of the day, four-fifths of blacksmith's troubles, they were using the wrong coal. Let me tell you, that wasn't four-fifths of blacksmith's trouble back in 1916. What their troubles were, were this. Their customer base was driving by, honking the horn, and waving at them. Their customer base had changed. They weren't going in to get their horses shoot anymore or get their carriages fixed. And this is the same thing that's happening to media today. Your customer base has changed. They're kind of going by, and they're waving at you. What these blacksmiths did back then was really fascinating. Some of them, not all of them. They had their blacksmith shops. They had cars passing by. They decided they weren't in the business of shoeing horses. They were in the business of serving the transportation needs of their communities. So a lot of them put up gas pumps, and they figured out how to fix tires. And I think the media industry really needs to define itself as to what business are you in? You're in the business of informing the public. That's important. But you're also in the business of helping people sell things. Something happened to me when I was an editor of a, of a paper. Did I step on something? The lights out. Um, uh, when I... <laughs> When I was the editor of a, you want to go on or do you want to wait till the lights come back? It looks better now, don't worry. Yeah, yeah it doesn't shine off my head, is that what you're saying? Um, when I was the editor, uh, or an editor at the Virginian Pilot, um, the son of Frank Batten Sr. was taking over Frank Jr. We used to call him Jr. Um, Jr. came in and he was my age and he was married to a copy editor that I used to work with, so I already didn't like him. And he came in and he said, you know, when you think about it, and he was standing in front of a room full of reporters and ad salespeople and everybody else and being introduced to them. When you think about it, we're in the business of 
I know what I wanted to hear. You know, rallying the bad guys, informing the public, putting out a great newspaper, writing great headlines. And he said, helping people sell things. I thought, damn, I need to find a new job. And he was right. He said, if we didn't do that, you know, we would really not be in business. So we really have to put out a great product that reaches the public, that people are interested, that people buy, that provides an audience, that helps people sell things. You know, I began, that began my thinking a little bit differently, that we have to think differently as an industry. And it certainly got solidified as we began to see news audiences leave newspapers and leave radio and see people leaving television right now. Primetime audiences are declining. So you began to see back 100 years ago these articles in these trade journals about the automobile repairman. And they did schematics of engines. And they said there's money for an automobile repair. And somebody wrote in, I'm very much interested in the automobile department as I think the blacksmith should carry a good sideline. And that's the same thing that I think we need to look at today. What is that sideline? Thank God they were thinking that way. A lot of these blacksmith shops turned into car repair shops. Some of them turned into big car dealerships because they thought differently. Are you still thinking about we need to provide news to the community? You've got to really think differently. What's been put in front of you is this huge communications conduit. This ability to not only speak to the public to provide news and information to them, but let them communicate back to you and to facilitate those communications. Those are fantastic opportunities. Every newspaper now can be a television station without getting an FCC license. Every television station can be a newspaper and provide classified advertising. The conduit that's offered by the internet allows you to do so many, many different things. So you have this great opportunity if you look at things as the way the blacksmiths did to define your customer base differently and break the mold of the business model that I think is holding a lot of people back. It's the business model of we need to talk about journalism, we need to talk about informing the public, we need to get the word out there a little bit more. You've got to think about the business side. Those in the academic side of journalism really need to be pumping out graduates who understand the business model. Understand all the aspects of business. That's an important part of sustaining journalism. So to give you an example of how the industry doesn't really think this way, and I, I believe the, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but I've got to tell you, I am in front of hundreds of people every month speaking. I speak about 30 times a year. I speak to television people, and, and television people are great. Television people have the best hair, they got the greatest clothes, and they got the whitest teeth. I talk to radio people. Radio people have more gray-haired ponytails per capita than anybody I've ever seen. <laughs> Newspaper people are generally just pissed. But I talk about <laughs> what's going on, and, 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 and I think a lot of them kind of get it. But some of them are still hoping digital will go away. And here's proof. I write a column every couple of weeks. And I track pretty closely the past 36 ones that I've done. How many views they get, and how many shares, and how many likes, and how many comments. These three get three times more than average. And one of them gets four times more than the next highest one. You see anything similar in the headlines? Digital advertising hits the wall. Yes, that crap's going away. Digital on SMB's minds, not so much. Yeah, I knew they hated digital. Guess who's winning in digital? The answer to that was newspapers. That bar chart shows that newspapers, which is true, get five times more revenue than anybody else in digital advertising, trying to sell digital advertising in the marketplace. $16 million in a large market. The next highest one, TV stations or radio stations, maybe about three or four or five million dollars, maybe. Um, so those got shared the most which tells me the industry is just dying to see this digital crap go away and hear great news about newspapers. I saw something in Editor and Publisher. Anybody from Editor and Publisher here? Good, we can talk about them. Saw something in Editor and Publisher this week, um, that maybe it was last week, and it was just, you know, the power of newspapers and how great they are. Great. Okay. <laughs> But should really be trying to do that and really trying to say, wow, oh, this industry is so great. The advertising industry doesn't believe it. They do not. 
if you send reps out there or people out there that talk about how great and powerful the newspaper industry is, they're not going to believe it because they see otherwise with the advertising that they're placing. As soon as we come to the realization that this is occurring, I think it's really going to help. You don't need to tell people how great and powerful they are. You should communicate the data that you have about who's reading newspapers and how big your audience is and what the demographics are. But don't try to be mean other media. I see it all the time. I spoke at the keynote of the radio show in Nashville a couple of weeks ago. And they're always tallying radio how they reach 92% of adults, the most of any medium in a week's time. Radio. Radio. You know, how television. People spend four and a half hours a day watching television. Advertisers see through this story. I think we have to become really realistic and understand what's going on with our media and stop fighting digital, as it were, competitor, or worse, in some cases, trying to embrace it as it's an extension of our core product. It's not. It's a completely different medium altogether. What we're doing is forgivable because it was done back in 1920. And it was done back in 1948 when the first FCC licenses were issued for radio and then for television. Anybody know what these call letters have in common for these TV stations, which actually were once radio stations? World's greatest newspaper, Cedar Rapids Gazette, Chronicle, Houston Chronicle, um, San Francisco Chronicle, TMJ, the Milwaukee Journal, WSBT, the South Bend Tribune. When a new medium comes along, the very first thing that you do is say, oh, I don't know what this is. It's just a redistribution of the old medium. And that's what everybody's done. Everybody's designed a website that looks like the front page of a newspaper. It's got the mast up the top and an index down the side and copy here. And ooh, we can do a couple of other things like have hypertext links and actually video. That's great. That is not the model. That's what everybody does. When the first radio program was aired in 1920, it was a couple of reporters from Pittsburgh newspaper on the top of the Westinghouse building ripping and reading stories about the 1920 election, which, by the way, was between two publishers, Warren Harding and Jim Cox. Their interpretation of radio, commercial radio, it's reading a newspaper. What would radio be if that's all it was? The first interpretation of television was what? Taking the old radio stars, Dragnet and Gunsmoke and I Love Lucy, and putting them in front of cameras, right? That was the first interpretation. And this discussion, by the way, was being held about television in the 1960s. How are we going to make any money at television? Because people were hemorrhaging money in local television stations because they followed the same business model, not just the programming. But the business model that radio has is one sponsor for an entire program, which worked in radio, but it didn't work in television until Bupele invented spot TV, and that's why we have so many damn commercials every 20 minutes. So that made television sustainable. So what we've done in the past has a load of lessons for us. We need to look at the Internet very differently. It is not an extension of the core product is not about putting news and information online or tweeting it or putting... That's part of the story. But this medium at our disposal is much more powerful than that. And once we get people understanding that and breaking out of the mold, and it's going to take people who are not in the industry, I'm sorry to tell you, to do it. People who are not, like me, who have been in the industry for years and see things only one way, that it's about a bigger audience, it's about a mass audience. And the more audience I get, the more advertising I can sell. That's not it, really, at all. Half of the people who buy a newspaper on Sunday buy it for the advertising. That's the franchise, the big, scary franchise the newspaper is really losing. That's the big, scary one. When you want to buy a set of tires or a mattress this weekend or Memorial Day weekend or Labor Day weekend or Columbus Day. Where are the big sales? Where are you going to find them? You're going to go on the internet? Where do you find the big sales in your market for mattresses? Do you go to the internet? Do you go through your mail? Does that have the big sales? Do you stop and watch television for several hours to wait for big mattress commercials to come on? No, it's in the newspaper. People are buying the newspaper because it's the last aggregation of all the big sales in the marketplace. That's the franchise that's being lost, and that's what we have to think about. That is sustaining journalism, and that's the scary part of it. Don't think of your brand so much 
as this big, powerful brand that everybody trusts and respects. They do to some respect. But your brand also carries some baggage, which Coca-Cola, the biggest, most recognizable brand pretty much in the, in the world, spending a billion dollars a year on marketing, new enough to say, hey, when we launch a new water product, spring water, we're not going to put it in the Coca-Cola bottle and we're not going to put the Coca-Cola brand on it. The brand, as big and respectable as Coca-Cola is, also has baggage. Your newspaper and your television brands say, I'm a newspaper, I'm a TV station, I'm a radio station. It does have baggage. It's respected in the community and you can leverage that to some extent to what you're doing. But when you go on to this new medium, be really careful. WGN, WSBT, all those, you thought they were television logos, right? Didn't carry over the brand, thank God, of the television station or the, or the newspaper. And thank God for that, because when, tele when radio was created, the first people who started radio stations, for the most part, were newspaper publishers, big publishing companies in local markets. And when television stations were created in the 1948 through 1958 period, most of them were, were established. A lot of them were established by newspaper publishers. What are we doing today? We're setting up our website and allowing our newspaper people or our TV or radio people to manage that whole thing. How would a television station or radio station that was set up by a publisher fare today if it had your print reporters reading stories on air? That would be the most boring TV show there was. It's a very different medium that requires a very different set of managers. And you really have to think about this. This is tough for a lot of newspaper publishers or radio or TV general managers to think about, but it really is true. You have to have somebody who is solely focused on this new medium and knows the assets. I'll tell you what the difference is and how to figure it out. If you, if you can imagine what happens at most media companies, we'll just say newspaper, um, they say, okay, we want to hire you in to handle our digital stuff. So here's what we want you to do. We put you the news online and we want you to, to sell some advertising around it and we want to you know, promote the brand and hey, we also want to sell subscriptions. Everything is being pushed to that person. That's just a product extension. They're being told what to do. To do it right, a publisher would say, or the owner, here are all my assets. Here's my brand. We think it's highly respected in the community. Here's all the copy, the content that we have. Here's an advertising sales staff, here's capital, here's some money you might be able to work with, and maybe there's some other assets. We have a building here. You can have some office space in the building. What would you like? What do you want? I guarantee you that person's gonna go for the capital first. <laughs> You're gonna use that. They might use the content, they might not want the content at all. But look at all my assets, how can you leverage them into building a new business for me? That's a very different way of approaching things, and there are some very successful companies that are doing that. These are their logos. You might recognize one or two, but you probably don't recognize any. If I told you who they were, you would recognize their logos, their names. They would be McClatchy. They would be Gatehouse Media. McClatchy, Accelerate, Gatehouse Media, you can't read it, Propel Marketing. DMM Media, Dallas Morning News. Deseret Digital Media, KSL TV and Deseret uh, Newspaper. Town Square Media, big radio company. High Road Digital, Jones Media, a bunch of small newspapers. They don't have the newspaper names in any of these. 2060 Digital, Hubbard Broadcasting, Hubbard Radio. These are the new entities that are beginning to form. They're completely new brands. They're the Dasanis of the media marketplace. They're saying, I'm the big sugary soft drink. People love and respect my brand, and they probably will for years. But when I create this new medium, I want to tell people that I really understand digital. I want to call myself 2060 Digital instead of Hubbard Radio. Because I don't want to send somebody out there and say, hi, I'm with Hubbard Radio. I want to sell you search engine optimization. What do they know about search engine optimization? They might know a lot, but they got the baggage of the brand with them. There's a way of telling who is really understands it and knows it, just a really simple way that I've found. And that is, ask the company how many people they have dedicated to digital. Some will tell you one or two. I'm full-time, full-time people doing nothing but digital. Some will tell you three or four or five. That's great. If they have none, 
they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> they're not. They're a newspaper company. They're a radio company. They're fine. They'll be okay. They won't see revenues grow anymore. If they have three or four or five or six or seven, the more they have, the more they are focused on this new business opportunity, the more they will become sustainable companies and support journalism in the future. And there are a few of them out there. The other thing that you look for, maybe they have a couple, maybe one or two, and there are quite a few companies that have one or two dedicated to digital. Ask them if that person has the newspaper or the television station's logo on their card. If they say yes, they don't get it. They're not using digital for all of its opportunities. They're using it as a product extension. I'm a newspaper guy. I got some digital stuff here. I'm a television guy. I got some digital stuff. History has shown that these new entities that seize the new medium and make a business out of it and sustain themselves do so as separate ventures. We're beginning to see more and more of that. I can tell you a 25,000 circulation newspaper in a small market that has 25 people dedicated to digital working for it. And there are a few like that. Most 25,000 circulation newspapers have one person or half of a person dedicated to digital. This one is all in. I can tell you some others that have 50 people or 60 people dedicated to digital, larger entities. They are not doing this in a very tepid or careful way. They go, this has grown for two decades. We're not going to hold back anymore. It's probably going to continue to grow. We're all in. We're going after it. They're investing. And they're growing the business and building business, not a product extension, but building new businesses. So we put together this infographic. I want you to read it right now um, with the help of Brad. Where's Brad? Brad Thatcher with Thatcher & Company, a, a, a public relations firm in, in New York. And we, with the help of a couple of companies, uh, media companies that chipped in, hired them to tell the story. What is the story of local media? I'll help you read some of this in a moment. Don't try to read it. You'll burn your eyes. Um, but it's a huge infographic. I would love for you to get out there and push this out into the community. I would love better if you got into the hands of advertisers or business people. Because this is the story we want to get to them. Our story is being told for us. People who are unfortunate have their stories told for them. Successful people tell their own stories and tell it really well. And this is the story that's happening to some local media companies, quite a few of them actually, but not all. They're transforming. Here's the URL if you want to download it. The $133 billion in local advertising, um, in the local advertising industry is responsible for 40% of all advertising. It's more complex and counterintuitive than it might appear. The untold story is traditional media companies aren't dying, but morphing into something different and more relevant to their advertisers. It's happening. Even with only a handful of them doing it, this is what that looks like. There are 91,000 sales reps out there. The largest chunk of sales reps, these are the frontline forces that sell advertising, are run by newspaper companies, second largest radio companies, third largest yellow pages companies. 88% of local businesses say they trust these reps as marketing people to give them marketing advice. There's your leverageable asset. You've got newspaper just got 26,000 sales reps out there supporting journalism, selling advertising. 88% of businesses say we trust them to bring us marketing ideas. We trust them with digital. Bring us some great digital ideas. This might be eroding fast if these people are not trained to do this. So that shows you there is a really strong level of support down in local communities. Right now, local media companies, local media companies, newspapers, TV, radio stations, yellow pages companies, are generating, this is last year, $10.5 billion in digital advertising. Is anybody talking about this? They're talking about, oh, well, we're selling a little bit of digital this, a little bit of digital that. I have a database of 11,000 companies across this country that report their digital revenues to us. I know who's doing well. 11,000 of them, which is about everybody. I can sort it by market share. We know how much is spent in the market in digital advertising. We know how much people are making. So we can make that little equation and say, here's the share. So when I sort it by share, I know who's doing really well. It's not the people making all the money. Sometimes it's these smaller market guys selling this digital stuff like crazy. 
helping these advertisers tell their story with digital media, whether it's LinkedIn or whether it's Twitter or Facebook or Pinterest or buying Google keywords or doing something on their own website. This is a fascinating story. This is where media, com media companies can help sustain journalism by morphing into something very relevant to their local advertisers. Newspapers are the largest. Out of that 10 million, 50% of that money is generated by, is there anybody talking about this? Is anybody saying, that, that, you know that chart I showed you earlier? That's, I think it's why it got shared so much. If the people said, uh-huh, yes. The largest, this is so counterintuitive, the largest entity in any market that sells digital advertising is Facebook, Google. No, it's a local newspaper because they have those relationships with advertisers in the marketplace. They're slipping away, I have to tell you that. They really have to be shored up because newspapers are finding that the model is becoming very different. It's not about selling banner advertising on a website. It is helping them with weird things like listings claiming and reputation management and shooting a video for them about their business, telling, helping them tell their story. There's so much going on out there. So if you look at local markets and you take it down to fairly small markets, maybe the lower half of all communities, businesses spend 75% of their total advertising dollars with traditional media companies, including a significant portion of digital advertising. So that trust is there. It's not all Google and Facebook sucking that money out. Although that's occurring more and more, particularly with Facebook. If newspapers and TV stations and other local sales reps in the markets don't understand how Facebook works and don't start working with Facebook and helping advertisers figure out how to market themselves on Facebook, a lot, of more money, a lot more money is going to get sucked out of newspapers and TV and radio. We run the largest survey of local advertisers in the country. We run it once a year. We do a monthly panel of about 2,000 advertisers, and we are tracking significant movement, scary significant movement toward Facebook. The number of advertisers buying sponsored posts on Facebook has doubled in a year's time. We think most of it has happened in the past eight months. It's doubled. It's up to 62%. The satisfaction rates with those Facebook postings, 90%. That indicates it's not going to churn like Google keywords did. Facebook is your biggest enemy, your biggest ally. Pay attention to what they're doing because they're taking advertisers away from local media. When we ask advertisers, you said you're going to increase, everybody's increasing, everybody, 70% of advertisers are increasing their digital spend. 70% say they're increasing it over the next 12 months. We asked them, okay, you said you're going to increase your spend to that 70%. Where are you going to take that money from? Are you going to increase your budget overall to do it? Are you going to take it from a traditional media entity? Or are you going to do a mix of both? 38% said they're going to take it from traditional media. 42% said it's going to be a mix of both. 80% say they're going to cut traditional media to fund what they want to do in digital. The largest single group, and this is a scary statistic, said they're going to cut, when I say it's a scary statistic, everybody gets quiet. It's a meaningless statistic, no. 40% said they're going to cut their newspaper budget a lot to fund digital. Let me say it again, 40% of newspaper advertisers from April to August is when we took this survey, said they intend to cut their newspaper budget a lot to fund digital. There's trouble ahead. There's a lot of trouble ahead. So paying attention to what these advertisers want, I think is just really, really important. So this morphing is occurring. This is really, really interesting stuff. 86% of traditional local media companies <coughs> now sell digital services. They're selling stuff like reputation management and um, search engine optimization and building websites, things that support these advertisers and what they want to do in the medium. They believe that they own and control and can go direct the consumers. So a lot of smart media companies are in there helping the advertisers do that. More than half of all advertisers, 55%, say they're going to redo their website this year and the vast majority of them say they're going to look at somebody outside to do it. Got that? More than half of all advertisers are going to redo their website. 
When you ask advertisers what's the greatest source of leads, number one, outside of referrals, is their own website. So think about that. More than half of all advertisers are going to talk to somebody about their number one source of leads if it ain't the local media company, that person has the ear of the advertiser and is going to draw the customer away to do other things. When that advertiser says, wow, you did a great job, Joe, on my website. This looks terrific. Now, I'd like to promote it. Um, I'm thinking about buying some newspaper advertising. What do you think Joe's going to say? Unless he works for a newspaper. Or I'm thinking about buying radio advertising or TV advertising. Because no, you need to buy more some of the some more of this digital stuff. That's why it's so important for those frontline reps to be out there, understanding what's going on, and helping the advertiser. And they want this. The advertiser wants it. Help them with their marketing decisions. I'm going to end with a couple of quotes. Don't believe me. Believe the advertisers. This is the audience you should be paying attention to. This is, and we have 6,500 quotes like this. If you want to see them, let me know. There are many like this. Give us more knowledgeable representatives who can suggest options backed by knowledge and data. The new generation of adults are not reading newspapers. These are your advertisers, so we must find other ways to advertise to them. There goes the support for journalism. I run this business myself, and I'm not savvy with social media. I wish I could find somebody I could trust to improve our presence at an affordable price. Trust, there's that word. I think it's incumbent on your business and you to go to these local business owners and help them. They have a story to tell. They believe, most of them believe they are the best kept secret in that market. Nobody knows about them. They see the franchises, they see the big chains, the Targets and the Walmarts advertising a lot and they're wondering how to get business. They need help. They're the backbone of this country. They provide a disproportionate number of jobs in local communities for people who, by the way, subscribe to your paper or watch your television station or listen to your radio station. They also have more dollars kept in the market than a Walmart, which takes money out of the market. Isn't it your responsibility to support these people, to help them tell their story? Where's Carl? Carl, you here? You didn't know I would call on you. Carl Tucker. He just stepped outside. Good, let's talk about it. Carl runs the Daily Voice, 76 sites around 17 counties or something around here. And he has a staff of people that provides journalism, information, news, etc. He has a half a staff of people that tells the advertiser's story. They put together videos. They write stories. It's native advertising. He calls it partner content. They love it. This is what you should be doing. Treating that side of the business that has always been separate a little more close and a little understand that your mission and have a little more understanding that your mission is not just to inform the public but to help these other people have access to this audience somehow by helping them tell their story. They don't know how to tell their story. They don't know what to put in the tweet. They don't know what to put in that. Give them a full page and say, here, here's your ad. Design it yourself, Mr. Hardware Store Owner. What do you think that ad's going to look like? Oh, let's put the name of the store, True Value Hardware, up here. Ooh, we have hammers for sale. Let's put that there. And we just hired three new people, and let's put their picture there. Ooh, our hours of operation. And we have a new gardening center. Let's put that. Before you know it, nobody's going to read that ad. They need help telling their story, and that is your role. I think that's one of the most important things that I can tell you is to help those local businesses tell their story. If you don't, other people will take your money away from you, and there goes your business model. If you want to see how those stories are being told in a really simple and stupid way that you might not quite understand, but it will get you to begin to think, go to youtube.com slash yellow pages. YouTube.com slash Yellow Pages. And the guys used to be with AT&T are now with a company called YP. It's a Yellow Pages company. One by one by one, by thousands, by thousands, by tens of thousands, they're running these 90-second to three-minute videos of these advertisers standing in front of their plumber's truck telling you why they're such a great plumber. Some of them are a lot more sophisticated than that. They're charging four to $5,000 a piece. And every advertiser wants one, and then they want to redo it, and then they want to do more, and then they want to do more. This is helping them tell their story. Where are they taking that money from? Well, they're taking it from some of the Yellow Pages books, but they're taking it from newspapers. They're taking it from radio. They've learned how to tell the story well. 
And I think that's what we have to look at. I'm really encouraged by what media companies are doing today. Some of them, not all of them. I think there's a reticence in the community with some smaller papers, and I think it might be forgivable because a lot of them just don't have the funds to do what I'm saying to do, and change is really, really hard. It is so difficult. I can make it sound great and easy and simple, but I get to walk out that door and go home, and you poor people have to implement all the crap I just talked about. That is hard. That is hard to do. And I've worked with some media companies. We go down in just a couple of markets a year and try to work with them just to see, you know, does this stuff actually work? How is it working? And it does work, and it can work. It requires a commitment, and it requires a very different level of thinking. So I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope I've given you some, some thoughts, something to think about. I hope I've challenged you a little bit and, and maybe thinking differently about the business model. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. I can leave. <laughs> yes, sir. I really think what you're saying is that the, uh, we used to have a line, you know, be like journalists, journalists, reporters on one side, and editorial and uh, advertising on the other. What you're saying is just the hell with the blurring of the lines. Let's just jump into advertorial. I mean, really. You're saying, let's go make content for these people. Let's do, uh, you know, uh, 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 reputation enhancers, other key words that you're using. It's, it's not about, like, sustaining local journalism anymore. It's like, really, let's just give in and just start doing advertorial. Hmm. Do, you have, do, you have, do you have a different business model that works? Do you think the business model, and this is a rhetorical question. I think question. the business model can still work. I think that what's happened is that so much of uh, <clears throat> journalism, especially in daily newspapers and in the middle market papers, have become just blather versus like really good journalism. It's like this is what's happening. So our, our, our industry has gone from being journalists and, and news reporters and storytellers and and gatherers of, of information, news, and uh, advertising supporting that to, like, let's suck up to Mr. Advertising. So, not to be argumentative, but I'm going to be. <laughs> okay. Let's go back 100 years, okay? Oh, look at these, look at these horses, you know, and how much faster they are than automobiles. If we would just put a little more money into fixing up our blacksmith shops. I understand, but I think the journalism model is failing. I think we have to find, it doesn't work because there are 10, ad to, 10 to 15 ad units on a page for a newspaper in print, and they're 2.5 and much lower priced in online. That model doesn't work anymore. What model would work? Now, the model that Carl, did he come back in the room? No. Yeah. Gone for good. Has, I think, worked. And it's not, it's not as black and white as you say this. It's not a blurring of the lines. He has, he has placed more emphasis on helping the advertisers tell a story. Is he getting the journalists to do it? He is not getting the journalists to do it. So what I'm advocating is put a little more emphasis on the advertising department and help them tell the advertiser's story. I'm not saying get your journalists to go over here and do that. What I'm saying is, if you don't shore up your advertising department, you may as well shut down your shop. I agree shop. about the advertising department side, but I think that the whole concept of journalism, you know, of, of publications, I'm going to use publications. Let's even use, you know, the, you know, your phones as publications as just a, a convoy for, uh, as a, a convoy for uh, bringing out an advertiser's message. I mean, we're losing local journalism. And we're look. We're losing the integrity of of what we all, what some of us got into this trade. I, you know, I, I understand what you're saying. I understand that tomorrow's media is, you know, this kind of environment of yes, let's create uh, fuzzy good stuff for, you know, uh, Mr. True Value Hardware or whatever. But I, I think that if you, I, I think what's happening is that you are seeing the traditional decline of an industry implode on itself because it doesn't have the capital to support what it used to do. But I also would take issue and say that 
the audience has shifted. It's not, it, even if you had great newspapers with great journalism, I'm not sure that the business model on the internet would actually support the way it does in print. So, 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 so we vehemently agree. Yeah, I, in that part, I do agree, I think that... <laughs> are there any other questions, or is this guy going to just dominate the conversation? <laughs> no, you're great. It is a great question, and it is a really important one, and it's one that I am uncomfortable saying that I know the answer, because I don't. What I can tell you is I can watch all these other companies. You know, I get to sit up on a hill and look at all the troops and movement, and I say, those guys are going to run into a buzzsaw over here, and those guys know what they're doing. And I see some people who are... Gatehouse Media, for instance, next year is the only company, the only newspaper company I know that has said, and I think it will, see its revenues grow. A newspaper company seeing its revenues grow again? Are they going to be able to hire back some of those people they laid off? Well, maybe if their revenues grow again, they have a sustainable model. No other newspaper company but they're not a newspaper company. They get hundreds of millions of dollars from the digital side of the business, from the event side of the business, and if they didn't do all that, and it's completely separate from the journalism side of the business and the news side of the business, if they didn't do all that, they wouldn't be able to support journalism. And I think we're all saying the same thing. There was a question here, yes? I was just gonna say two points about that. One, advertising is always been viewed as content by readers. Mm -hmm. um, advertising is news, if it's not news, it's worthless. Right. Eight of Fox. I have always tended to think of it as separate, but for the, for the reader, it often is also considered content. Oh, yeah. The other thing is, my entire career has been about trying to become a publisher so that I can make the money that I need to produce the journalism that I want to do. And I think that that's, you know, you can still maintain your integrity while producing alternative means of revenue, because if you don't, you're not going to be able to produce the, the kind of journalism that I think McClatchy's whole thing about journalism is that, you know, they're going to create sustainable, they're going to create business models and businesses that will sustain community journalism. And a lot of what they do with Accelerator, True Measure, all the other things that they're doing, they're completely commercial products. But their very altruistic mission is create a business that provides the profits that supports community journalism. And I think that's the route that all of us would love to go. Yes, sorry. So tomorrow, there will be a panel on nonprofit models, and this um, New Jersey News Commons has put a great mix of nonprofit and for profit. So it sounds to me like your advertising model is pretty conventional, and that that's what's going to drive the journalism. Whereas in nonprofits, we've been talking about as much diversity of revenue as possible. So advertising would be one piece, foundations would be another, individual gifts would be another. Lots of uh, major uh, events would be another, and sponsorship would be another. So, what? How would you take that conventional model you've been talking about and put it in a nonprofit? Would you look at, say, universities' missions as as telling their advertising story and nonprofit? You know, there's many, many huge uh, philanthropic uh, sources that we're looking at now. So, you would would you translate your model to that? I did some work last week, as a matter of fact, with Greater. Public, which is the group, the Trade Association for Radio, public radio stations, they had the same question, essentially. They make very, very little in digital. They try to stay away from it, even though their, their licenses, which don't allow advertising, don't translate to the internet, so they, some are actually selling advertising, but they're all nonprofit. I think what resonated with them and some of them, some of the big stations in San Francisco, Boston, etc. Um, is this, again, an altruistic mission that they need to help inform the public by helping these sponsors tell their story, sound familiar, to the community, particularly in healthcare. Healthcare, as I said earlier this afternoon, the industry does not advertise its rates. You're not going to get cardiac surgery half price next week only. Um, <coughs> So what they do advertise, and services, legal services, sometimes they will advertise rates, but um, a lot of the service industries, particularly healthcare, want to get information out, education, and they will sponsor large amounts of programming, hands off, uh, to get information out as long as their name is tagged along with it somewhere, Humana Hospital or, or, or whatever. Um, I keep referring to Carl because he told me this great story and then he just left on me. Uh, but a lot of his 
partner content, which is basically native advertising coming from the health industry. And I think, you know, you do have a great deal of, of philanthropists or big companies that have some mission, some goal to keep their brand in front of some. I think it will contribute larger amounts. Another thing is events. Um, quite a few companies now making money off, media companies making money off events, which fits very nicely hand in glove with your journalistic mission of informing the public. You know, there's so much going on in healthcare these days and the aging public and so many advances in healthcare and changes in, you know, uh, health insurance and things like that. Holding a fair, an event, a forum, uh, holding forums for even high school uh, sports awards. That's what Gatehouse is doing. And a lot of these other companies are doing as well. Town Square Media, which is a radio company with 300 stations, makes... But I think these events and helping inform the public could be a political event. It could be a health fair. It could be a job fair. It could be a car show. But I think events are another way to look at it because there will be big sponsors for that. In the nonprofit realm, it's probably more of a forum than it is a show with tables where people sell stuff. Yes, sir. So I think a lot of your, your presentation kind of centered around bringing some of these traditional media companies into the digital space and getting them really to delve into that. My, my take, and I'd like to see what your take is, is that I don't think it's a bad thing if a lot of these old behemoths go away. Um, I mean, I can speak for the Gannett paper. Let me stand over here when you say that. You? <laughs> Go ahead. Say that again. I can speak for the Gannett paper in, in my area. They're completely tone deaf to what the communities they cover um, want to read about. And a lot of that is because of, you know, top-down corporate management that have been brought in from all over the country. Um, just, you know, bloated staffs, a big building that they have to maintain. It just, everything about it just strikes me as well, what we don't need in the media landscape today. So is it a good thing that some of these companies are venturing more into digital, or should we let startups get a chance and maybe provide some framework where they can uh, work together and, and somehow create an infrastructure of success rather than, you know, celebrating that the same two or three companies are now successful in digital and get 90% of the advertising? I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> but being a consultant, I'll try. Um, and it'll sound good. No, I, I, I think that um, what you may be describing is what we see at the local level and is how could a small or individual newspaper, or maybe even a big gray, you know, newspaper company like Tegna um, or Gannett, uh, Tegna's their television arm, um, really get and understand or create something new. You know, wouldn't they just watch it happen and, and acquire it? And I think it's a mix of things. They are doing some acquisitions. They're watching things occur and, and mix, uh, mixing it up a bit. Um, but I think more than anything, and this is the part I, I can't quite figure out, um, but I do think it will happen, is that we've lost control of this medium. We don't really control. We can control our website. You can't control Facebook. You can't control Twitter. You can't control what people do and what they tweet back or comment and, and all this. It's all kind of out of control. A lot of media companies down at the local level are making about 14% of their digital revenue from ads that appear on other people's websites through the programmatic networks or through the retargeting uh, audio extension networks and things like that. So I guess the first part of your question was, wouldn't it be good for some of these big you know, entities to kind of go away? I think it may eventually happen, and I think it will be the companies that, and you can't say a company like a Gannett, for instance, is just stupid and they're not doing the greatest things. In the world. A lot of these companies are public companies, and they're beholden to the stockholders, and they're not rewarded for investing the stockholders' money you know, in the hopes of some return five years out. It doesn't work that way. Family-run media companies, not all, a lot of them, have a little more patience and are being a lot more creative with these things. You have Calkins Media in Doylestown, which owns some newspapers, owns some TV stations, which they're selling. They've created OTT stations. Everybody familiar with that? Over the top. You get through Amazon Fire or Roku. You can go on and you subscribe to the Doylestown Intelligencer. 
There's some damn good stuff in that, in that program. And it's not just news from the paper. It's, they got a cooking show that's actually pretty popular from one of the chefs in the local marketplace. So there is some creativity and some new things. I think what you have to look at is look at this new medium that's at your disposal. You don't control it, but you can master it to a great degree. What are the types of things that you can do knowing that your mission is to inform the public, to help people sell things, to master communications, you know, to be some big communications media company Whereas you don't need a multi-million dollar printing press or an FCC license. It's all at your disposal. What do you want to do? It's a very, very creative medium. I hope that answered your question. I think I might have time for one more, but who's going to, Merrill, are you going to call it? Well, Gordon, part of the answer to that question is that many, many things have died. We have a fraction of the newspapers we want to have. There's no longer an afternoon newspaper marketplace. So some of that creative destruction is already underway. But my question was, this is an audience uh, substantially consisting of entrepreneurs. They can't create an ad agency within their own small company, which may have one employee or five employees. What's the entrepreneurial message from your point about relationship building with the advertiser? Mm. Um, I think there, there are really, really big opportunities, probably bigger um, for the smaller entrepreneur adequately financed. Uh, a lot of you will do it on a shoestring and will do it on existing revenues, which is actually a good way. Um, but once you've proven the business model, if it works, you may want to look for more capital. But the advantage of the entrepreneur is historically always better than someone who is encumbered by an existing business model. It's the, it's the innovator's you know, dilemma. It's the um, incumbent's problem to protect an existing business model while trying to create this other new one. And there's stories again and again and again about how businesses have tried to tackle a disruption internally and failed because they apply the old business model or business practices and they have conflict. There's so many stories about that. Clay Christensen wrote about a lot of them. So if you're an entrepreneur in a local market saying, I'm going to create this website or this information channel and I'm going to do this, I think you have to have eyes wide open and say, who can I disrupt? Who is not paying attention? Who is unable to compete with me? What is the market opportunity? I would encourage you to look at the money first, because that's really what's going to sustain your business. Who's going to support this? Might support it with money you've got from being laid off or an early buyout or money you have in a bank account or money that you know a couple of rich relatives gave you. But in the end, it's going to have to be sustained by by, by certain customers, whether they're advertisers or people who pay for the content. I just think there's so many opportunities out there. There are so, so many opportunities out there because the internet has really paralyzed a lot of media companies and, they can, and it continues to change. There's something new every year. I hope that answered your question. Okay, great, thank you very much. <laughs>